ako po si Jitanji. It is such a special month because we get to celebrate Filipinas in our community here in America that are really inspiring because of their history. Not history, but her story. We get to talk to Mona Pasquil today here in Los Angeles. Mona, thank you so much for making the trip out here. Of course, thank you for having me. Well, we celebrate you this month wow. and all the achievements that you've accomplished because really it is setting the way, the path for others to realize that they can do it too. Good, because that's the goal. Yes, that is the goal. <laughs> so let's start off. Mona, saan ka ipinanganak? Where were you born? Sacramento. I'm okay. a Sacramento girl who, born and raised there, moved just for a short time to Washington, D.C., uh, back here in L.A., and then home again. Okay, so I went full circle. Third generation yes. Filipina. Mm -hmm. um, what does it mean growing up as a third generation Filipina in America where, you know, I mean, yes, we are still a minority, but fast becoming the majority. Right. But at our time growing up, it wasn't the case. That's right. Everyone has their own stories. Mine is very, I feel very blessed to have my family and I grew up with all the Manongs who worked in the fields. So we were in the Central Valley. We grew up with them, took care of them. My mother took care of them. We were always surrounded by their stories, who they were, where they're from. They were all single men, right, because they didn't marry. Um, and so we were their family. I grew up with parents who empowered us to kind of always think outside of the box and do something for the community and follow your dreams. Um, but always doing that, keeping your culture and who we are as Filipinos right there at the forefront, sharing our story, telling people who we are so that you, know, you demystify Filipino. Everybody has their own path, but you educate them always. Okay, but growing up in a time where discrimination was rampant let's mm -hmm. face it mm -hmm. did you face this when you were younger I did in Claymont Delaware when my my father was going to grad school and kids just I was the only uh, Filipina there was one african-american boy and me um, and every day after school the boys would follow me along the you know as we left the school they'd grab my bag throw everything all over the ground and call me all kinds of names and I'd run home to my mom and my dad and I would say I'm Filipino right and, and yes, of course, well, why are they calling me all these other names? And so from, that was about six, seven. You, you, you know, when you go back east, it cer certainly wasn't Sacramento where we saw everybody. Mm. And there was a rich, rich and very organized Filipino community. So it was difficult all the way through college. I went, uh, went to Marymount College in Kansas. My first mixer, um, a young man came up to me and you know, when you grow up in a Filipino household, you, you, know, you don't get to go on dates. With alone, you have to go with 16 people. Yeah, and so, <laughs> yeah, and this man came up to me and he says, well, where are you from? And I said, California. He says, well, what are you? And I said, Filipino. And he said, what's that? Huh. So it was, you know, I was 18. And I thought, you got to be kidding. And just like when I was a kid, my father and mother would say, tell them who you are. And when you're a kid and even when you're 18, you want to roll your eyes and go, really? they're really gonna listen to my story. Mm. So what did I do? I took kids to my grandfather's who lived an hour away and my Uncle Manny would cook every Sunday. And he would talk about being a Philippine scout, being in the army, and kind of educating people about who we were. And slowly but surely, you know, I kind of, I made more friends. But it was, it was stunning to, to you know, be so excited about going to college and being hit with a, well, what are you? Yeah. It hurt. Yeah. But it only made me stronger. Mm. <laughs> I remember when I first moved out to California, I met a white boy who said, why is your English so good if you're from the Philippines? <laughs> and I was like, is this guy insulting me right now or is he just ignorant? Mm -hmm. You know, but you have to realize here in California, we are surrounded by a lot of Filipinos. Mm -hmm. You go outside of this state yeah. and that is not the case. There yeah. are a lot of people that think Filipinos live in trees. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so you're they right. They have no idea who we are. Uh huh. So it's about educating yeah. them and, yeah. and sharing our story. That's right. Mona, can you help us understand how does one decide that they're going to get into politics as a Filipina here in America when there's nobody else that one is Filipino that's a politician and two a woman at that like what goes through your mind to make you decide that 
this is what I'm going to pursue. Mm -hmm. Well, ever since I was a, a young kid, my parents were very supportive of, you know, figure out what you want to do in the mark you want to make in the world. Hmm. And uh, I remember going to the Capitol in fifth grade and eighth grade and seeing that there was at one time no women and the next time one, one woman. And I thought to myself, uh, I want to be there. And it was because I think of the security that I felt and the encouragement from my family and, and mentors um, that, you know, why not? Why not me? And so I, my dream was to always be an elected official. And as I grew, as I kind of grew up, I realized that my, where I really wanted to be was behind the scenes. And I really wanted to be in a good supportive role, but in a senior role. And I wanted to open doors for many others uh, to actually run, um, and I would help them run. Mm. I think for me it was, why aren't we there? I, I, from, I mean, when I was young, I asked that question, why aren't our faces there? Why aren't more women there? Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, let's do it. Okay, so being a trailblazer, because really that is what you are. You're, you're going on this path that nobody has ever been on before. There must be a lot of challenges to that. I mean, I know that now you're in this position. You're, uh, you're there in Sacramento. You work there. You work in this big playing field mm -hmm. of, you know, politics. Mm -hmm. But can you walk us through sort of like, how does one ever begin? I mean, what did you major in? I mean, can you walk us through that? I was going to be a teacher of English Lit. Huh. Uh, but one of the things, even in college, I was always a student activist. And I think part of that, I've, I've always had that in me because I think it was very deep with my father. But when you, when you are able to see governments, local, state, and federal, and you look around um, and you realize you want to be a part of it, the first thing you need to do is get a mentor, talk to people. Figure out, how can I do this? Ask a lot of questions. And sometimes, uncomfortably, you push yourself forward. I've been really lucky. I've had great mentors. I've had people like Maylee Tom, the first Asian CAO of the Assembly, Mignon Moore, who was Clinton's uh, political director. I've had great women mentors besides my family. Mm. And one of the things that I learned from them is, is they opened the door for me to have the opportunities to apply and show what I have my job is to do the same for others. So I try to do that still today. You gotta work really hard. I was the last one in the office many times um, because I knew it was important to, to show them that I, and prove to them they were right in picking me. Okay, so when we return here on Kababayan today, we're going to walk you through the ladder of success that this woman has achieved. We're so proud she's here with us today, Mona Pasquil. We'll be right back.